The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Science has an extraordinary way of surprising you when you least expect it, of revealing secrets about your world you hadn't known, or, on the other hand, of shrugging its shoulders when it cannot find a scientific explanation. Speak to most scientists about psychic phenomena, and they'll look at you as though you just handed them a cup from a flying saucer. So, now you know what we're about to relate will not be easy to believe, but that doesn't mean it isn't so. Probably no one knows the ins and outs of this tale better than Jack Woods, a Washington reporter. Yes, I'm a news reporter, and Washington is my beat. My paper, The Washington Record. I've come full circle with this story, right smack dab up against a dead end. Bob Buckley, my editor, knows it's true, but nobody anywhere will print it. So I'm telling it out loud, hoping someone will hear it and do something before it's too late. The dateline to this story, and this is the truth, is the world tomorrow. It began when Buckley called me into his office. Pull up the chair, Woody. I want you to look at something. Did you catch this headline in the time? Mysterious Soviet vehicle in orbit puzzles space observers. Yeah, I saw the story, Bob. Well, what do you make of it? Not much. Probably some test flight for a future space station. That's what I thought until I got past the first paragraph. Read it, Woody. The space vehicle has been observed by several members of the Air Security Group, an international group of non-government space watchers. They have confirmed the vehicle's puzzling characteristics. It is as big as Salyut and very bright and sending out strong radio signal. So, (laughs) the Russians aren't the only ones we're orbiting hardware, too. Read on, Woody, read on. This Soviet space vehicle appears completely unrelated to any previous satellite put into orbit. So... What happened last week in the sky, Woody? In our sky? Well, you wrote it. You must know. Oh, a report from Pasadena that the Traveler space probe was ignited briefly so instruments could get a fix on the star Canopus, which is guiding it to Jupiter, then the usual takeoff. Uh-uh. Read this. Oh, no. It can't be. Oh, yes. It is. A vehicle exploded. Just coming across the wires now. Terrible. Where's the rest of the bulletin? Well, let's go over to the teletype and see. Agency reports. Death to all aboard the manned space vehicle. Man, this is one giant step back in our space program. Woody, 
I'm putting these two stories together. You're telling me there's a connection between the flight of a mysterious Soviet vehicle and the explosion of ours? I'm not telling you that, Woody, but asking you to find out. That's the assignment. Get going. Where to? Well, you're the reporter. You plot the course. Oh, okay. I'm still not sure why you think there's a link between these two happenings. I dug up every word in the morgue envelope. I called the Soviet embassy, gave my name, and said I was doing a feature on space and would like to come talk to one of their officials. While they decided on a date, I moved to the Cape and my old friend Captain Tom pressed the information chief of NASA. We, uh, we don't understand it, Woody. We haven't had an accident like this since the flash fire in 67. But you finally find out what happened on the launching pad. Eh, this accident wasn't a takeoff. This was re-entry. Re-entry? None of the wire services carry that. And neither will you. This is off the record. I had no idea Traveler was coming back. Yep. The day before yesterday, five of our men disappeared. Wire services said there was an explosion. We really don't know what happened. Not a trace of the spacecraft or the men has been found. But you know they re-entered. Do you like to hear the tape? Off the record? You bet your life. I've never heard one of these things before. Now, there are two reels. The end of the first is racked up, and it's pretty much the last communication we had with them. I'll, uh, I'll switch it on. Where did it come from? 
He got your report, Woody. I think we've drawn a blank on any tie between the mysterious Russian space vessel and the disappearance of Traveler. Don't be too sure, Bob. I'm not giving up yet. Oh, uh, did you get that call back from the Russian embassy? Yeah, I've got a confirmed date in the morning. Good. Uh, by the way, here's that list of all the items aboard the Traveler. Captain Tom sent it up from the Cape. Letters, the food, a couple of plaques, personal stuff, anything carried by the astronauts, but not a teddy bear in the lot. Well, even if one of them had, it would have burned to ash like everything else. Excuse me, Woody. Yeah, Buckley here. Yes, Paul. Yeah. Where did you learn that? Well, that's incredible. Well, I don't know if we can assume it's the same one, but... What did NASA say? No comment, eh? Uh-huh. Uh, I've got Jack Woods here. He's been working on it. I'll, I'll pass this along and we'll get back to you. Oh, uh, send the verbatim text of what she said up here, will you? Thanks, Paul. Unbelievable. What is... Well, when the story about the teddy bear broke, one of the wives of the astronauts, Ed Harmer, asked if she could see it. She called the White House. See it? Why? She says her husband did have a toy teddy bear with him in his suit. Oh. It was a present from one of the Russian cosmonauts. Our man took it with him. For luck. Oh, we... Buckley here. Yeah, it's for you, Woody. Hello, yes? Yes, Jack Woods. He did? When? Hot, the ambassador himself. Tomorrow morning, that's great. What time? I'll be there. Thank you. Believe it or not, the Russian ambassador himself wants to see little old me. At 10 in the morning. Yeah. Woody, when you're drafting up your questions, see if you can get a reaction to this. What's the lowdown on that Russian icebreaker hitting the North Pole? There's nothing up there but icebergs and propaganda. Okay, we'll do. Anything else? Well, we never got a satisfactory explanation of that fire they had in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. The State Department clams up when we call. Nobody knows anything. Maybe the ambassador does. We'll try. It's crazy, Bob, but why does my gut tell me all these unrelated stories tied to one little thing? You mean that toy bear swimming in the Pacific? Exactly. That teddy bear. Of course, there could be two teddy bears... One carried by the astronaut and atomized into the sky along with $10 million worth of space hardware and five American lives. Another found floating in the ocean. It's a little hard to believe there were two, but even harder to believe it could be the same one. Are Sputniks and icebreakers and embassy fires all linked? Perhaps there will be a few answers when I return shortly with Act Two. The newspaper knows lives on his feet, rings doorbells, plays punches, and never makes up for lost sleep. He's a kind of public detective, generally unknown and unsung, seeking truth and, as the saying goes, rushes in like a fool where angels fear to tread. So, good luck, Jack Woods, wherever you are. At 10 a.m., I was sitting outside the Soviet ambassador's office on 16th Street, waiting. Leafing through the latest copy of Soviet Life, their slick monthly magazine written in a few languages for distribution all over the world. One story caught my eye. It was called Experiments in Psychic Research. I was reading it when the embassy attaché came over. Mr. Woods, I'm sorry the ambassador has been delayed. Please make yourself comfortable. Do you uh, mind if I ask you a personal question? What is it? I've always wondered, is it difficult for a Russian like yourself to feel mm, at home in America, here in, in Washington? That is my profession. An attaché must be at home wherever he's sent. Uh, the ambassador will see you now. Uh, sit down. Sit down, Mr. Wolf. Uh, now, what can we do for you? A few questions, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, recently, we had a news item describing a mysterious Soviet 
space vehicle. Can you tell me about that? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Robes. All I know is what I read in your American newspapers. But it is called Cosmos 29. Well, perhaps it's part of assembling a Soviet space station in orbit. Perhaps. I hope so. Anything else I can tell you, Mr. Woods? Uh, yeah, you, uh, you have a nuclear icebreaker at the pole, and I was... heard about that. No, the Arctic. <laughs> can you tell me what it's doing? Very simply. Our government is looking for a shorter shipping route, that's all. Well, how did your expedition know it was at the North Pole, since magnetic compasses don't show the true north? Our space satellite told us. In while The satellite... Uh-huh. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, not at the moment, I'm afraid. No, no, no. Tell her that I... Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, come to the door. I will explain it to you. The ambassador went to his door. I got up and walked to the window and looked out. In the reflection of the glass, I could make out his visitor was the attaché. They talked mostly in Russian and a little in English. Two words caught my ear. Gerda Chesler. I stared out across 16th Street, pretending to be oblivious to what was being said at the door. I uh, cannot change my appointments. Tell the doctor I shall be in touch tonight at the usual number. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Ah, now, where were we, Mr. Woods? Oh, by the way, have you heard anything new about the disappearance of your traveler spacecraft? Not a word, Ambassador. My uh, condolences. A sad day for science. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Wasn't it strange that out of the blue, the Russian ambassador should inquire about the traveler? Perhaps Buckley was right on target, believing it was connection between our accident and their mysterious footnotes. Call it a reporter's instinct, but the little voice inside me said, follow up Gerda Kessler. Back at the office, I checked our files and the telephone directory. No Gerda Kessler. I called information. Yes, they had a Kessler, Dr. G. A new number, unlisted. I pitched my idea to Bob. Could he locate Kessler for me? All right, here's the address you want, Woody. Kessler's How'd you get it? <laughs> we have pipelines. Do you have any poop on Kessler? Well, only that Kessler came through immigration two weeks ago and is a scientist from some important Moscow institute. Well, there's a connection to the ambassador, and I aim to find out. If this Kessler is involved in some shenanigans, maybe I'd better not go to him with my bare face hanging out as Jack Wood's reporter on the Washington Record. Well, what do you want to be? Well, I'll play it by ear, but if I need any verification, expect a phone call from me, will you? <laughs> I'll back you up, Woody. With troops, if necessary. Yeah, I hope it won't be. Yes? I'm looking for Dr. Kessler. It's at G. Kessler on the mailbox downstairs. How did you get inside? I pressed the button mark superintendent and I walked up. Who are you? My name is Jack Woods. I represent, uh, shall we say, interested people. Interested? And Dr. Kessler. How did you know where the doctor lives? The ambassador told me, the Russian ambassador. I see. Please to come in. So, you are Mr. Woods? What can I do for you? What I have to say is for Dr. Kessler here only. I am Dr. Kessler. Uh, my name is fictitious. I represent some extremely wealthy people who wish you to assist them. And what makes them think I can assist? Well, the ambassador told me Then that... you know why I am in Washington. No, I do not wish to know. It is none of my concern or that of my principles. The ambassador told me as much as I care to know about your work. I was with him when you called. He'll be in touch with you tonight. Ah. You see, Dr. Kessler, not all Americans are sympathetic to our form of government. That is good. As you no doubt know, I am here on behalf of the Bechterev Brain Institute. 
What can I tell my principals? You mean how effective is our work? Exactly. We deal only in actions, not words. We also. When we talk, it's in millions of dollars. How can I verify that? Well, to begin with, call this number and ask Mr. Buckley. Better yet, I'll dial and have him speak with you. He is one of my principals. May I? Ah, yes. Mr. Buckley, this is Jack. I'm with Dr. Kessler now. I told her our clients have no ceiling on their price, but the doctor has exactly the qualifications for our needs, and I've asked for her cooperation. Uh, good. She'd like a word with you that I'm bona fide. Put her on. Mr. Buckley will speak with you. Thank you. Mr. Buckley? Yes? Uh, may I say that whatever expertise I have, I shall be happy to put at your disposal. Uh, has Mr. Woods informed you as to our project? Not yet. But I presume it is in the extrasensory field. Uh, extrasensory, yes, yes. Uh, glad to hear it. Uh, well, I'll leave the arrangements to Mr. Woods. Is there anything else? It was not about money I wish to speak with you. When it comes to a matter of belief, we do not talk in dollar signs. Uh, glad, glad to hear it. Goodbye. Oh, he is a very abrupt man. He believes in actions, not words. Interesting phrase, that. In our work, it is axiom. To keep it to the point, Doctor, can you briefly fill me in on your work? I cannot take all the credit. There are many scientists in Soviet Union. So the ambassador told And we are all working on extrasensory perception. Control of mind from distance. Even, uh, even perhaps from an icebreaker or a Sputnik? Ah, uh, so you are informed. <laughs> Please, proceed. Suggestion from a distance has been for many years the project of Professor Leonid Vasilyev of the Soviet Academy of Medical Sciences. Thought suggestion of unconscious to cause subjects to make unconscious automatic movements, a change in brain activity, circulation, etc. Have you uh, participated in these tests, Dr. Kessler? Oh, I have. That is why I was sent to Washington. Ah, so you could engage in the private work also. I do not see why not. It is all for benefit of science. Now, tell me, are you saying that at a distance, any distance, thousands of miles, the distinguished members of your, uh, Brain Institute? Yes, the best that I've instituted have yes. given commands which are obeyed by a designated subject? No, Mr. Woods, not a command in words. That is where all previous experiments have failed. Command in thought, action of thinking, action, that words. Uh, now I understand your axiom. Also, we have developed psychic receptors which can pick up unexpressed thoughts as well as expressed distant conversation. And you've had success with this. Such success that even I, as a scientist, have not been told how much. I'm not a scientist, but I can appreciate what you've developed. As a political person, I can, in fact, see a great need. I need not tell you, then, of the day we are anticipating being able to sit in Moscow and clairvoyantly tune into your Pentagon or cabinet meeting of president and overhear a high-level conference. <laughs> of course you mean overthink. Ah. I'm impressed. I can see that ultimately the Soviet with such extrasensory powers could dispense with its uh, entire espionage system. It wouldn't be necessary. How interesting. You should say that, Mr. Woods. Dr. Kessler, I'm going to ask Mr. Buckley himself to join us for the further meeting. Delighted. I'll be calling on you in a day or so. Please do. So, we shall call our meeting terminated? Our first meeting. Now, which door did I come in by? I can't remember. This way. After you. This isn't the way out. What's this iron door? Let me out of here. Mr. Woods, you are inside our detaining room. You will be quite comfortable. 
There is air through the ventilator. A cot. A chair. Are you kidding? Comfortable looking at you through a steel door with a small barred window? It will not be for long. We shall have a pleasant exchange of thoughts. Yours and mine. Now, listen, Doctor. You had better let me out of here if you know what's good for you. People know where I am. They'll come looking for me. What if they do? They may not find you, Mr. Woods. No one will have seen you. You may even have disappeared. Trouble. Big trouble. Quite obviously, Jack Woods has stumbled upon something important. He has unearthed the top of a Russian top secret, and they mean to find out just how much he knows. Were this a fantasy, we could tell you all to breathe easier. But the fact is that psychic warfare is a reality. We learn more and hope for the best when I return shortly with Act Three. Power. World power is the name of the game. To that end, nations place the highest priority on methods of killing. Thousands of years of so-called civilization, and yet today, we're no better off than when we were cavemen, attacking and defending with clubs, sticks, and stones. One asks oneself, will it ever end? Will greed and suspicion and death-dealing weapons ever disappear into history? Will civilization ever become more than a word? I must admit you are a very good bluffer, Mr. Woods. For a few minutes, you did fool Gerda Kessler with your story of your clients and their millions. It's no story, it's true. It is false, Mr. Woods. You gave yourself away when you spoke about espionage. That put me on guard. Immediately, I read your mind. You are not emissary of wealthy Americans. You are news gatherer for Washington Record Paper. <laughs> Of course I am, but that's only a cover. Interesting. Look, you cannot keep me a prisoner. Too many people know I'm here. We shall see. I have to get instructions. All right. I admit I'm a reporter. All I was after was a story. That may be true. It was not wise of you to come here under false pretenses. Doctor, if you can really read my mind, then you know I'm on the up and up. Up and up. Bonafide. I've been on the record staff for years. Your thoughts did not communicate that. But they did tell me your Mr. Buckley has a, a red beard. Then you have other thoughts, the lighter, more vague about our Sputnik, Cosmos 29, and Arctica, our icebreaker. Not, not very formed thoughts. Good Lord. You are a mind reader. Ah, in the same room, that is nothing. I warn you, Mr. Woods, your real motives or those of your so-called editor, Mr. Buckley, will not remain secret very long. We have our ways. You have been playing with fire and have burned your hand. Believe me, I am not your enemy. In my country, an intruder in my house is an enemy. My advice to you, Mr. Woods, is to make yourself calm and quiet. Be silent and cooperative. We are a fool, Doctor, to take this man into your confidence, a stupid fool. Ah, I warn you, Mr. Ambassador, I do not take your criticism lightly. I told him nothing. That is why you have him locked up, because he knows nothing. Only the little he imagines and what he has read. I cannot understand why you did not dismiss him as I did. Mr. Ambassador, may I remind you, Moscow has sent me to Washington to be in charge. You may have official position, but my activities have official priorities. I am only saying I know the American mentality far better than you, Doctor. Ah, let us not surmise or grope in dark any longer. I am now to put my mind on Mr. Wood's wavelength. You will make notes of everything I tell you to. When do we start? Now, this second. You will remain absolutely silent. How do you start your communication with him? By thought. What is his first name? Jack. Jack. 
Jack. Your thoughts are mine. How long are they going to keep me here? So weird, I can't believe it. And I break up poles, put in the skies, pushing out with a kind of psychic telemetry. It's crazy. Good Lord. I wonder if that Kessler thing is tuned into my very thoughts right now. I make my mind total blank. How do I do it? Oh, I know. Two times two is four. Two times three is six. Two times six is twelve. Two times seven is fourteen. Two times eight is sixteen. Well? He is crazy, this American. What do you mean? Either crazy or clever. For the last 30 minutes, all he is thinking is multiplication tables. Now he is thinking poetry. Poetry like what? Here is one. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How doth your garden grow? What is that? Uh, nursery rhymes. It is said to little children. This man is clever. He is jamming his thought waves. But it is only because he knows. Because you told him you can read his mind. That was extremely foolish. I am convinced he knows nothing. You think he has no idea how we maintain his psychic control? Yes, he has what they call a, a hunch. Nothing more. You are absolutely false. How could he? Such a scientific conclusion would stagger his imagination far beyond where it can go. <laughs> saying things were getting pretty hairy down here. Oh, well, they were not worse. The disappearance of travel is driving our man up the walls. Well, I came down to ask you personally, what about that teddy bear? Oh, we got it here, under glass. Under glass? <laughs> we have it in a decontamination chamber. Same kind we use for astronauts who return from space. Well, I gather then it was identified. Oh, yes, positively. And in such a crazy way. See... Ed's wife, widow, I guess I should say, saw it and said it had to be the same one Ed took with him. She was positive. How could she be? Well, the way she tells us, one of the Russian cosmonauts sent it to Ed as a memento of friendship with a note saying, take this little Russian bear into the sky with you. Yeah. When Ed Harmer opened the package, somehow in the mailing, the ear had come off. Ed's wife showed us just where she'd sewn it on. Well, that'll be... It was the same one. Well, can you fellows explain it? <laughs> All we can do is accept it. The toy survived, and I guess nothing else did. Is anybody asking themselves why? You have a theory? I brought this Soviet magazine with me. Jack Woods picked it up at the Russian embassy. Have you seen this? Well, is that the one with the story on psychic water? Yeah. Well, that's all right for science fiction buffs, but there are many down on the Cape who go for that idea. A fella brought one down the other day, and we talked about sending out shock waves of thought, but I can't say it sounds feasible. Mm hmm. Well, when I was a kid, walking on the moon, shuttling from the Earth to other planets, docking half a million miles in space, I can remember when nobody thought that was feasible either. I say, Tom, I think it's possible. The Soviets are developing machinery that can tune in anybody, anywhere. Oh, I can understand the possibility of reading other people's minds, okay? But to make people act against the will of the distance? Come on. Well, suppose you had on you a thought receiver, like, uh, well, like a radio. The enemy sends a thought telling you to do something. And even without thinking, automatically, you might do it. Hey, Bookley. I wonder if you aren't on to something. It's Teddy Bear. Yeah, the gift of the Russians. He had it on him. It could be that he instinctively, or someone else, or even all five of the men in the craft, followed some outside command and caused the traveler to malfunction. Hey, Bob, I'd better take this up with the general. I'm glad you came down. Or, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm sorry. I can't believe it, but it's true. They're letting me go. 
sometime early in the morning, I woke up, and behind the barred door, I could see Dr. Kessler standing looking at me. Dr. Kessler. <laughs> I looked at my watch, but it had stopped. I, I tried to remember if I'd been dreaming. And I wondered, could she read my dream as well as my mind? No, I cannot, Mr. Woods. Dreams are too fast and too fleeting. Besides, I, too, was asleep during some of the night. Well, at least you didn't keep me awake with an interrogation. I appreciate that, Doctor. Oh, you were questioned, but you didn't know it. Did I give you the correct answers? Sufficient. I, uh, I confess to you, Mr. Woods. I kept you here as a guinea pig. I want to find out whether my training would work on an American. And did it? Some thoughts were understandable, others difficult, and some even incomprehensible. For instance, uh, what is meaning of Peter's Piper Picks and Pecks, some pebble pickers? Oh, you mean Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers? If Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, how many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? Yes, yes, yes. Now, what is the meaning of that? Just what it says, Doctor. Just what it says. I ask you to meet me here at the Arlington Cemetery, Doctor. Because here we will not be disturbed or overheard. Yes, please. I understand you let the American reporter loose. Yes, he knows not. You are mistaken. Not only he, but his editor. They know a great deal. That is not possible. You have let your scientific enthusiasm run away with you, doctor. You have failed to take elementary precautions to guard the Soviet secret. But the ambassador... The ambassador was not so foolish. I knew at the moment he mentioned your name in Mr. Wood's presence, but it was too late. Why do you think, Doctor, we take the precautions we do? That the chief of our bureau, myself, I am disguised as a, a nothing attaché to the embassy. Would you be specific, Chief? What do they know? They know that the little Russian bear, which they call Teddy Bear, was our battery of power, and from it came the psychic signal, causing ultimately the destruction of their craft. I had nothing to do with that. It was directed from Moscow. You supplied more pieces of the picture for them, which they have fitted together. Doctor, you are, I am afraid, no longer useful. Oh, you, you don't mean that. I have asked Moscow to recall you. Uh, this Jack Woods and this other man, his editor, they know nothing, believe me, nothing of our success hypnotizing telepathically at a great distance. They know nothing of our experiments in driving men to erratic behavior from 4,000 miles away. They think their multiple murders are a psychopathic accident, not the result of our experiments. They know nothing of how we can induce brain hemorrhages or heart attacks. Nothing. Believe me, Chief. If you can still read minds, you know that I would like to believe you. Oh. But one American reporter loose could be the beginning of an avalanche. I have him under control, Chief. He is wearing a battery of power. I charged it myself. He does not know it, but he would be unable to betray us. Be that as it may. We shall have to wait now for what Moscow decides. I sat with Bob Buckley and we compared notes over the weekend. I found it hard to concentrate. I even wondered if my hunches were my own or was I accidentally tuned in on the same wavelength as the Brain Institute in Moscow. Bob and I were afraid it was too much guesswork and not enough hard facts. I went back to go to Kessler's. The place was empty. The Russian ambassador had been recalled to Moscow. Then a funny thing happened. All of a sudden, I just didn't care anymore about the story. 
Now, at that time, my wristwatch suddenly started to go again. And has been keeping perfect time ever since. Is it possible? The wristwatch, the controlling battery of power, like the teddy bear? If so, what of all the other objects, gifts given to traveling executives and members of Congress when they visit foreign soil? Is that why our government is even now checking into presents given to former chief executives? Does our CIA know to what use these gifts can be put? Does anyone know? I shall tell you as much as I know about it when I return shortly. What you have heard is largely based on fact. There is a Bekhterev Brain Institute, and there are many Soviet scientists like Leonid Vasilyev who are today experimenting in extrasensory perception for the long-range control of the mind. A new fear may be replacing the old fear. For what need now is there for an atomic bomb if you can make your enemy obey you without it. Our cast included Michael Wager, Ian Martin, Martha Greenhouse, and Cork Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.